Good morning, friends. Welcome to another Word of God, OBE Journal, 2019, number 15. After uh, last night's uh, trip around the uh, planet and an encounter with uh, Dave of the Atlantic Ocean that seemed to be adept at taking on human form briefly to communicate, um, I thought I'd better uh, reference uh, a book I've been looking at recently. Kurt Leyland's Otherwhere. This is a 2019 release, uh, um, uh, not a sequel, but uh, a republication of a book from uh, uh, tw uh, 20 years ago and um, with much updated information on his astral travels and, and encounters with uh, human and non-human intelligence. And um, fascinating book. The original was good. This one's even better. Highly recommended for all of you. His experiences are quite unique, uh, significantly different from uh, anything you've heard me talk about. Although not different universe, just a different take on the situation. And um, different from Jürgen Zhu and uh, Todd Akamis and others. And uh, as I say, highly recommended. And um, there's about 30 pages on Encounters with Davis. I can't possibly read it all. And um, we'll try to go for one chapter, chapter 22, Final Deva Encounters. And... Um, significantly, you know, um, personal, shall we say. And there's no reason why your encounter shouldn't be significantly personal as well. Um, there is no... Uh, Davis are very fluid. Um, they can take different forms. Whether they choose to or not is another story. Um, my experiences tend to be uh, going right back to more adventures in eternity, where you'll find that Davis stuff in there and uh, some of the more recent talks and explorations a little more influenced by Jeffrey Hodgson whose book Kingdom of the Gods has artwork in it that I've shown and maybe I'll dig it out again and uh, they're definitely sort of non-human forms like giant bursts of, of color and sp spheres in, in the sky sort of thing um, Hodgson had his uh, experiences, clairvoyant experiences, and uh, described them to an artist who painted them in the book. So, as I say, we're, a couple of chapters before this where he uh, details his initial encounters, um, but it would take, I think, uh, at least three uh, episodes to read them all. They're, they're fairly long. And we'll see if I can squeeze in this one, because it's, it's very good and very useful. The climactic adventure in my exploration of the non-human zones involved a deva that I saw as a blue whale, the largest creature that currently inhabits our physical Earth. Dolphins average about 8 feet in length, orcas about 30, blue whales about 100. I was comfortable communicating with the astral devas I represented at dolphin, as, as dolphins. The ones I saw as orcas representing mental plane devas were nearly four times as long and considerably more spiritually advanced. Communication with them appeared to be the limit of what I could stand. But here was a deva whose image, as a blue whale, was twelve times as long as that of the devas seen as dolphins. Did that mean it was twelve times as spiritually advanced as the astral devas? As our minds melded, I sought to see her as a human being to make communication easier. My initial impression was that this entity was the most advanced spiritual being I'd ever encountered. And yet I saw her as an adolescent girl, i.e. not yet fully mature as a specimen of her type. Having at one time been overwhelmed by the intensity of the think-feel-love exchange between Astral Davis and nearly losing my sense of identity, there's a whole chapter on the, the method of communication being called think-feel rather than, you know, Something else, but it's, uh, again, quite long. 
I would have thought that this David's love, magnified by its size, might permanently un impair my sanity. <laughs> Yet the only difference I detected was in the clarity of the experience. Sometimes my adventures in the non-human zones had a murky quality, as if they occurred at levels of consciousness so remote to the ego that I was lucky to bring back any memory of them at all. However, the current encounter was clearer than the ordinary dreams that preceded and followed it. I was chosen because of how young I am, the Deva projected and think, feel. It was thought that this would make your first contact with our level of being less intimidating. I had to commend whoever had made the decision. The impression of an adolescent girl was so strong that I was completely unafraid. Yet I couldn't help wondering what it would have been like to meet a fully mature deva of this type. After acclimating myself to the deva's think-feel band, I became aware of a difference between it and the astral and mental deva frequencies. It carried a type of love that was parental in nature, eminently concerned with the well-being and fulfillment of others. We are the guardians, the deva can announced, responding to my thoughts. We watch over the entire cycle of learning that involves the order of devas. We are the final advisors and guides available to every step of deva evolution in the reality learning system. We make sure that our growth contributes to the quality of life of every species on the planet. There seemed to be a pause, a gentle withdrawal of the energy behind the communication. I felt surrounded by love and concern for my growth and fulfillment, as if bathed in a warm, reassuring light. No doubt I was being given the opportunity to absorb what had been said. After a few moments, the Feel Think message resumed. We're responsible for having initiated the program of learning in which you're now participating. Another momentary withdrawal. Again, the strong sense of warmth and reassurance, as if the guardians were letting me know that their concern for the welfare of the devas, disbelieved in and ignored by humans who often inflicted damage on their work, extended to encompass my own fulfillment and the well-being of all humankind. Even our virtual decimation has been a learning experience for us, the Guardian continued. We have con ex had to extend our range of responsibility for our peoples, in terms of awareness of their growth needs worldwide. In the absence of the numbers that once distributed our work more evenly and in smaller parcels, which you can almost call posts. This time, as the communication withdrew, I was left with a visual image. I saw our world as if from space, with radiant portions of light evenly distributed across the world's surface, land and sea. Each point of light represented a contact point for Deva consciousness, a place made sacred by humans or a fully mature, intact ecosystem, such as an old growth forest. From that contact point, a Deva guardian projected a net of comfort, concern and advice to all the lower Devas within the limits of its net, which was bounded by the nets of other guardians. The guardians associated with these nets evolved through a series of posts that constantly increased their reach, duties and responsibilities. Sometimes two guardians took joint responsibility for an area, coming together with the task of merging who they were and what they need to create a yet more highly developed being. This is how your world looked to us before humans began to interfere with the well-being of the environment on a major scale pursuing selfish and exclusively human interests at the expense of the greater good of all beings, the Guardian said, and this is how it looks to us now. Once again, I saw the earth from above. This time there were considerably fewer points of light. Instead of nets radiating from central points of contact, I saw hands of light crisscrossing the globe. They seemed more focused, more intense than the gently supportive nets had been perhaps more urgent. The, these bands appeared to weave a basket around the world. Every guardian was connected to every other by such bands, aware of another's presence and concerns. In the previous image, there had been little communication beyond the spheres of influence that bordered a particular guardian's region. 
There were holes or gaps in the connecting web, places where contact with the Deva realm had been so disrupted by human actions that they were no longer reached by the presence of a guardian. These holes were being covered as much as possible by channeling guardian energy through the remaining contact points in the hope that it would spread out from there into the bands. As fascinating as these images were, what amazed me more was the feeling tone of the statement. Even our virtual decimation has been a learning experience for us. That is strong, isn't it? Decimation. It was clear that by decimation, the deva meant the environmental destruction that killed, incapacitated, their ability to reach our world and work with it. There had been no hint of anger or self-pity behind this declamation, only a complete absorption in responsibility for the evolution of all beings in our reality learning system. To me, that seems uh, our inevitable result of our descent into materialism as a, as a species, as a consciousness. We, we moved away from uh, a spirituality admittedly heavily influenced by organized religion, um, where some religions wouldn't believe in angelic beings at all, and went you know straight to the Bible or whatever, and others uh, uh, still recognized them, but it, it was a, not a functional relationship, and uh, you know native peoples and around indigenous peoples around the planet would still recognize that, but uh, as they had um, oral traditions, we might not you know know of that, and. Um, so we cut ourselves off from the spirit world, from the spirit of trees, the spirit of clouds, the spirits of water, and uh, damaged our relationship. But it seems to have been necessary. If part of the ancient plan was a descent into materialism to see where that led us, and boy, do we now know, um, nuclear destruction and, uh, you know, all this nonsense about uh, running the show, shepherding other species, and you know, all that arrogance. Um, it would seem, would seem to me to be inevitable that in the ancient plan that that would happen. And uh, many, you know, humans and devas and angels wouldn't necessarily recognize that complete level or that more complete level of the ancient plan, and would be shocked, and would be using words like decimation. And uh, uh, so let me, let's move on from that. When I awoke, I still felt surrounded by the warmth and reassurance of the Deva Guardian, as if I'd become a part of its sphere of influence, and was now numbered among its charges. Rather than being terrified of this level of consciousness, I felt taken care of, protected, I knew that in trying to communicate with me, the devas would take no risks for which I wasn't properly prepared by previous experiences. I understood how careful they had been from the start of these attempts at communication between human and deva realms. Running like a refrain through so many of my encounters with emissaries were phrases such as, quote, it was thought that it would be best to approach you in such and such a fashion so as not to overwhelm you. End quote. So solicitous, so concerned with my well-being. Still in bed, I closed my eyes so I could feel this loving wave of absolute commitment to my fulfillment wash over me. I kept telling myself to remember what it felt like in case it ever went away, but knowing it never would. That a deva guardian should extend its caretaking to a human after what we've done to our world seemed like the ultimate degree of forgiveness. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Remember who said that? For the next two and a half years, I had few significant encounters with Deva consciousness. Then one night, I found myself standing on a wharf by the ocean, which seemed surprisingly deep so close to shore. I saw an astral deva who looked like a porpoise just below the surface of the water. 
I could also see a larger astral devil that looked like a dolphin, somewhat deeper. A few humans seemed to be milling around it. Their appearance was hazy and indistinct, a characteristic of sleepers and dreamers. That's a category of uh, the body travelers that he's spoken about earlier. You can imagine sleepers never wake up. Dreamers have dreams and then they're confused and you know. Um, like peers, whores represented the boundary between the human and the non-human zones. That must have been translating the deva think feel bands into physical terms, visualizing them as different depths of seawater. Less developed astral devas, such as porpoises, apparently used a higher frequency band than more developed astral devas, as seen in dolphins. Higher may not be the right word. More like easier to get to or less psychologically distant from the level I operated on. I reached my hand in the water and tried to get the larger astral deva's attention so that it would come to me. Of course, this wasn't a real hand reaching into real water. I was translating a non-physical experience into physical terms testing the waters to see whether I was ready to dive into this non-human zone. The smaller astral deva responded instead. It came closer to the surface. Go ahead, dive in, it said. You'll be safe with me. I immersed myself in the zone the deva was operating in. Now I'll take you for a ride, the deva announced gleefully. I clung to the back of the deva. Up and down we went, from the surface of the water to the depths and back. I worried about whether the deva would be sensitive to my need to breathe. Would he bring me back to the surface every few minutes? It never occurred to me that any encounter with the deva, my deva, was taking place in non-physical reality, so breathing was not an issue. See, there's that uh, astral forgetfulness there, you know. It seems so real, you think it's physical. Yet I felt breathless. If for no other reason than the deva was moving so rapidly. Every time I tried to remind it of my need to breathe, the deva dashed off in a new direction, apparently laughing at me. Brackets, the deva was reacquainting me with different bands of think-feel. Its amazement arose because I was physicalizing my experience of these bands, misinterpreting my passage through them as diving and surfacing again in the ocean. After my exhilarating ride, the smaller astral deva took me to the band where the larger one was waiting to speak. I perceived the larger astral deva as a male. It was neither Henrik nor Fletcher. That's others he's mad that had, he, he wanted human names. This deva's energy felt urbane to me. I had a, I had a quality of refinement and culture, though I had no idea what cast, passed for culture among devas. To differentiate the deva from others I'd met, I imagined how he would look as a human. I saw a slender, tall gentleman with dark hair and well-trimmed goatee. I decided to call him Vincent after the accent, <laughs> actor Vincent Price. Now, that sort of uh, well-dressed, uh, debonair gentleman type, uh, when I first encountered uh, Maitreya uh, many years ago, 2000 and... Mm, Six two thousand and seven something like that, um, and that that comes in the book um, Jesus and the Christ. Um, that's how Maitreya appeared to me, <laughs> and I think he did that entirely to make me comfortable. Vince uh, brackets here. Vincent Price was not only an actor but also an avid art collector. This Davis. Function combined Henrik's acting, performance, self-expression, Fletcher's art, appreciation for fine technique and craftsmanship, and perhaps also Virgilia's organizing in the sense of collecting artistic and expressive resources. Thus, it may have been a higher deva than they, though still working on the astral plane. Something like a project manager for a creative project. As I say, there was another chapter dealing fairly extensively with those other devas, but uh, we have time constraints. Time constraints, that's the whole thing about incarnation, isn't it? Time constraints. <laughs> Welcome, Vincent projected to me in Think Feel. You're honoured to meet you at last. We've been hearing about you for quite some time, and I've been eager to make your acquaintance. The pleasure is mine, I replied. 
the smaller astral deva was still present, listening to our interchange but not engaging in it. You wouldn't believe how good it feels to finally be able to converse in a civilized fashion with a human being, Vincent mused. You're not like most of the others I've encountered. How's that? I asked. You had to pass through the human think field band on your way to ours, correct? Didn't you sense the presence of some of your own kind before you crossed over? I thought of the hazy people near the wharf. Um, almost all humans have that same indistinctness to us. Vincent continued reading my thoughts. It's an expression of how unclear they are about who they are and why they're on the planet. You've mostly revolved such issues, uh, resolved, so you're more capable of focusing within the human field think band as well as within ours. We could easily spot that clarity when it first began to manifest itself and we were eager to recruit you, as it were, for the kind of contact you now are experiencing. We were so eager to reach you that we came on a bit stronger than we should have. As Vincent spoke, I recalled dreams that had occurred before this sequence began when I was living in Chicago. I had dreamt that I was beset by alien beings who seemed intent on controlling my mind. These dreams often occurred in tandem with ones about my apart apartment being broken into and sometimes dreams about dolphins. You experienced our presence as an invasion of your consciousness, Vincent continued. In fact, you came close to shutting us out completely. Since then, we've approached you with great care, usually sending smaller deva types as emissaries. The larger, higher, more developed types would have overwhelmed you. The higher devas are quite powerful, and uh, as you know from other uh, videos, uh, I've merged with them or attempted, and uh, I'll get back to that in a minute. What you experience as our sometimes overwhelming intensity is an expression of the difference in self-knowledge I mentioned. We know who we are and why we're here, in every sense. Your awareness of the ultimate purpose of humanity, as well as of the part you play within the fulfillment of that purpose, is less complete. Thus, when you're in touch with us, you experience our greater self-knowledge as pressure, as a pressure, to increase your own. As you've grown in self-knowledge, that pressure has lessened and you've found these communications easier to handle. Now that you're mostly overcome your fear of being invaded and taken over by us, our chats have been quite cozy indeed. This is why I take pleasure in conversing with you. Through Vincent's monologue, I, keep, I kept asking myself why I felt no need to breathe. Both Davis broke into laughter every time I did so. They were amazed by the fact that I still hadn't figured out I was non-physical, in non-physical reality, not the ocean. I felt embarrassed that Vincent had praised me so highly for overcoming my fears, while I kept demonstrating my ignorance of how communication was taking place. Some time ago, we'd taken you as far as we could in your training without you becoming fully aware of your life purpose, Vincent said. That's why between then and the present, there has been no contact between us and you. When the process of acquiring, accepting, and acting from that self-knowledge has been completed, we can resume our communications. We're all quite excited about this. You wouldn't believe how boring the classes I've had to take in order to deal with humans and see how they are. There's not much we can do as long as most of you are so thoroughly addicted to physical reality. You wouldn't believe how boring the classes are. Oh my goodness. As if to undermine Vincent's point, I suddenly woke, feeling a strong urge to use the bathroom. Twenty years passed before my adventures with Davis resumed in 2009. It was no longer necessary to represent them as dolphins and whales, nor was I terrified to communicate with them. I must have become fully aware of my life purpose by then. Besides the Deva emissaries, uh, I perceived as porpoises, dolphins, killer whales and orcas and blue whales, I once encountered a further type whose size was between that of an orca and a blue whale. This new type appeared to me as a humpbacked whale. At 40 to 50 feet in length, such a whale was larger than an orca, smaller than a blue whale, and uh, per quite perceptible. I made the usual mistake of believing that I was directly in touch with the humpbacked whale consciousness. I was obsessed with the question of why humpbacked whales sing at the time. 
during my only encounter with this level of deva consciousness, I was told I was too new at the process of receiving and transmitting images in think feel to remember anything of the answer to this question, including that it was a wrong question to be asking, since I was dealing with a deva, not a whale. In a later adventure, an instructor told me that this type of emissary was called a record keeper. Davis at this level had access to the history of our reality learning system as stored in the so-called Akashic Records. They kept track not only of the evolution of individuals within the Deva hierarchy, but also that of each level, from the astral Davis to the overseers. In the Index of Zones and Beings Encountered in Other Where, I provide a list of Deva emissaries and how I perceive them. Rising in order of spiritual development, plane by plane. So, some Dave encounters from uh, Kurt Leyland. Thank you, Kurt. As I say, there's a considerable amount more, but I was uh, troubled with how I was going to get it in, as it were. When he meets the uh, earlier, when he meets the other Davis, that all have uh, human names. Um, there's some interesting descriptions. I called the first Deva Fletcher. In my mind's eye, he appeared as a stout man with brownish blonde hair, a round face, clean shaven, but with a thick, dark beard that coloured the lower half of his face. He wore a blouse like peasant smock with full sleeves and over it a dark green vest. Something about him struck me as bohemian in an artistic sense. I called the second emissary Henrik. He had dark hair, a full beard, fair skin, quite handsome. In one earlobe was a sapphire stud, and in the other a pirate-style ring. Intense eyes, penetrating yet full of fun. A performance-oriented fellow. I had no sense of his clothing. A third emissary I'll call Virgilia. She had a business-like air, to the point, direct, and highly efficient. Blonde hair, rather short and wavy. She was dressed in a navy blue skirt and matching suit jacket over a white ruffled blouse. Well, is that detailed or what? He seems to be doing a lot better than the other one we tried to reach, Henrik said to the others, unaware that I was now tuned into their conversation. Beg pardon, I projected. Oh, voila, now he's able to speak for himself. Turning to me, Henrik explained that he'd been trying to get in touch with other human beings through their dreams, without, but without success. They're like stones, he said. Even the ones who are aware of themselves as spiritual beings tend to be inert and non-interactive, and that awareness evolves with geological slowness. I laughed, thinking of all the years I'd spent dreaming of Davis as dolphins before the sequence of adventures began, never suspecting they were any more than dreams. Pretending these deva emissaries are, were human made it so much more easier to communicate with them. Now that I know your names, I said to Virgilia, I'll be able to call on you whenever I wish. I thought the syllables Virgilia, and to my bafflement, she didn't respond. Then it dawned on me that my images and their associated names weren't meant to function as a means of calling my deva friends but rather as a way of locating them again. Since I was unable to perceive landmarks, I would have used, had to use my images of these astral devas as psychological coordinates the next time I wanted to visit. Virgilia was struggling with the meaning of the thoughts I projected to her. Finally, she replied, We call our method of communication feel-think. We're able to project to each other only what we feel about things, Yet there's both richness and subtlety in feel think. We can't we cannot hear some of the things you say because there's no feeling behind them. Does that mean you have trouble with abstract concepts such as names? <laughs> Did you just say something? she responded. I guess that answers my question, I thought to myself, wondering how to proceed. Suddenly I had an idea. Let me try an experiment, I said. Here goes. Love, beauty, awe, faith, hope. I waited for a reaction. None came. Okay, let's try the same thing again. 
I love being with you. You devas are such beautiful creatures. I'm awestruck whenever I encounter you. I fervently believe that it's important for us to be communicating like this, and I sincerely hope you'll be patient as I learn how to think and feel. Or feel think. That is feel dash think. Virgilia got excited. Yes, yes, we believe the same. You felt our love for you. Love is the basis of feel think. On a whim, I decided to try another experiment. Actually, I'm lying. I really hate the alienness of emissaries and I don't want to be here. Can't hear you, Virgilia replied. So, I thought to myself, the basis of feel think is love. You can express love, but Davis can't hear you if you talk about it without feeling it. Also, it's important to lie. It's impossible to lie to them. <laughs> Not that I would want to. How different our world would be if we could say only what we truly mean and feel and no one could ever lie. I tried to rephrase my statement about being able to use names to call my Deva friends as a think-feel question. When you want to talk to Davis, I'll call Henrik and he's far away, I said to Virgilia. How do you let him know? I used a visual image of this scenario to underwrite my point. Oh, that's easy, she said. Every deva has a different quality of feel-think. I imagine Henrik's quality so that I'm waiting in the frequency band he usually uses. Then I send out a signal to get his attention so he'll tune into that band. Such signals travel far in this realm, and even if he's too far away, i.e. too psychologically distant, perhaps occupied with some task, other devas may act as relays. That can happen when you're, you're uh, trying to contact a diseased chimney. They're preoccupied with something in the, you know, a class or a constructive activity or, you know, whatever, and they can't respond to you. Davis are always scanning the feel-think band, so it's not unlikely that Henrik would find me waiting in his band during a routine pass, even if we were out of range of my signal. Generally, we use the signal method of getting attention only when we need an immediate response from Davis close by telling them to scatter because danger is coming. Interesting. Danger for Davis. Um, an example of danger for Davis would be humans trying to ensnare and enslave them for magical purposes. A practice of negative entities I will call magicians. Uh, you know, spiritually advanced, power-hungry humans seeking to control others through magical means to serve primarily selfish ends. Scattering means scrambling the feel-think bands so fledgling musicians on the physical plane can't locate them, like sandering up an astral smoke screen. How would Henrik know that your signal was meant for him, I asked. Compared to feel-think, said Virgilia, signals are a limited means of communication. There are signals for lots of food over here. <laughs> Any hungry deva will, who hears such sounds will search the feel-think bands until they find me. Then the combination of simple signal feel, uh, simple and complex feel think helps them home in on my location. There are other signals for playtime or let's make babies <laughs> that will likewise draw in who's ever interested. My understanding of this communication was faulty. It had nothing to do with food play or reproduction as we humans think of such things. Davis are fed by reverence and gratitude shown by humans for their work. Such feelings on our part help establish links between their realm and ours or make these links more secure. In the case of some devas, these links take the form of inspiration for projects to be undertaken by humans on the physical plane to better the quality of our physical and emotional life, through beauty, for example. Such devas are hungry only in that they're starved for work. Our culture seems to have so little appreciation and use for artistic beauty. Hmm, Really? Anyway, um, Virgilia's reference to play means creative play. For example, the improvisatory, improvisatory sorry, uh, quality of artists working with their materials to achieve an effect. Making babies referred to the realization of a creative project. Apparently, groups of devas may be involved in the completion of a creative project. Multimedia, theatrical film? That, that seems to me to be what they might be interested in. Now I have a question for you. If Henrik is far away, why would I want to call him? Virgilia asked. 
Henrik and I like each other, but I assume that he's not around. If he's not around, he's busy. Why would I want to make him stop what he's doing to come be with me? Well, I'm like that with people I know. You know, if you contact them psychically or mentally or even email, you just assume if you don't get an answer, you, you know, they're busy with something. Why would I want to make him stop what he's doing to come be with me? If I have an opportunity to play, I'd much rather be with another Deva who wants that too, rather than try to make Henrik do something he's not interested in. I was unable to answer Virgilia's question. It never occurred to me that friendship with people we have special feelings for and like to spend time with, laying claim to their attention, despite the fact that they may live miles away, might be a uniquely human experience. Anyway, there's some thoughts for you. Um, a very interesting book on all levels. The exploration of the human realms of afterlife and people, um, you know, going through these uh, various sort of uh, um, purgatories where they uh, help to work out their issues post-mortem. Um, some interesting stuff there, but that's not quite related to what we're talking about now. But um, very interesting out-of-body stuff, very interesting. And a fair bit of it wasn't used in the first edition of his book, from uh, which even 30 years, was it 30? Well, 25 years ago, I thought was very good then. And um, so watch out for that name, Otherwhere by Kurt Leyland. You'll find quite a bit more uh, listings of books and um, videos, video lectures, and uh, such things. Uh, very interesting uh, spirit, very uh, fine communicator of his uh, experiences, and uh, I would suspect very quite useful to all of you. Certainly, been it's been fun for me rereading that book. I, I'd almost I'm I wouldn't say I'd forgotten the first one, but you know it's in the pile of books, out of body books that I've got from years ago. Um, and certainly a contrast with, uh, we'll say, Jeffrey Hodgson's perception of Davis, um, who, who I was much influenced by. He and uh, Charles Ledbetter, and um, and also the, the all the literature evolved out of the uh, the Findhorn community in uh, in Scotland. Um, Dorothy MacLean and uh, David Spangler, etc. Of which, you know, that reached my years in the 1970s, which, let's face it, it's a long time ago. Um, but you'll notice if you go back to any of my videos or things that I, you know, I talk about merging with a being. Merging with higher self, of course. Merging with the, the, the deva that I perceive as hovering over um, Toronto and Lake Ontario. And uh, its function is double function of the human part and the nature spirit part, all, you know, all the beings of uh, in the water, the fish, etc., etc. Et and the blending of the, the, the vibrations and, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I don't remember having many urges to talk to them. I thought um, merging with a, a deva, a high deva, is about all I could manage, you know. And even then, I felt I was only merging with a small segment of its overall being. And uh, uh, But yes, this notion of having a conversation, that only came up uh, just yesterday with that uh, being. And likely it would be in the back of my mind, although certainly not consciously, that having read about uh, Kurt Leland's experiences, would have opened up that door to me that I could actually do that. And, uh, you know, a lot of our um, self-imposed limitations uh, on these travels and adventures and expansions of consciousness are the result of such things. Um, you have a certain, you take certain assumptions with you based on your previous experience and your <clears throat> conversations with others and studies, you know. 
And then someone presents a slightly different point of view, and then you go, oh, maybe I'll explore that. But certainly as we did that little astral trip yesterday, I hadn't pl had not planned that in any way. Uh, not consciously, of course. Um, and as you know, a lot of these uh, uh, talks and meditations and uh, guided meditations are not consciously planned. I sit down and only have the vaguest idea of what's going to happen. And um, that's uh, once in a while I do, but quite often I don't. Sometimes I have very strong memories of where I've just been, and I'll, I'll, I'll recount that for you, of course. And um, But other, other times I don't. And um, I'm sure that's all part of the plan, too. And I would certainly encourage you to, uh, whenever you're watching these or, or, or thinking these things over, to improvise your own experience. Allow it to happen to you. Don't uh, make a plan see, sit down to meditate, project, do the instant transfer, and just see where it takes you. And just be open to the possibilities, because anything can happen in the astral and mental and buddhic planes. Um, anything at all. I mean, seriously. <laughs> anything. So there is no limitation. And... Um, just to sort of keep that in mind as you... As you as you plow along, and um, and I should say that to myself. I should keep that in mind too. Um, we are infinite beings having an inf infinite variety of experiences, all of which are educative and um, fun. No reason why they shouldn't be. And. Uh, it's a while since I've done it, but when I was reading it, Dora Van Gelder's book, Real, the, Real, the Real World of Fairies, where she's interacting with the spirits in a, I think it's a tornado. Um, and uh, there's still very few uh, accounts of that sort of thing. Um, and uh, maybe I'll go into that again, just to remind us of how intense it is. You know, um, forest fires and tornadoes and, you know, that sort of uh, destructive activity. The, uh, the the devas that are directing that are very far beyond it. They're like uh, CEOs directing a, a large operation in a large company. And then the smaller, uh, you know, uh, salamander spirits of fire or the uh, spirits of the air, um, they're so wrapped up in the energy of what they're doing and the excitement of the energy of what they're doing. Um, they, they can't see outside of it. They're a bit like us, wrapped up in our experience. And um, so this, um, you know, as Jeffrey Hodgson said years ago, the, the Brotherhood of Men and Angels, it's a long-term project. <laughs> Has been for quite some time. And um, it's a subset of the, the greater brotherhood of sentient beings, of course. And... Um, all sentient beings, not just the ones you happen to like and know about. So, um, you know, details of the bigger picture, you know, jigsaw puzzle pieces of the bigger jigsaw puzzle. And I'm sure that uh, that metaphor uh, resonates for you. And uh, as the morning sun starts to sparkle on my human face, I will uh, bid you all a fond farewell. Au revoir, mes amis.